Welcome to Conversations with Creative Minds. We have been searching for the meaning of creativity and the role it plays in our daily life. People use creativity to express themselves in different ways, such as writing, painting, poetry, composing music, or innovating new products. Creative minds have never been more relevant than today because of the need to solve our society's dynamic and complex problems. Today, our guest is award-winning and New York Times best-selling author, William Martin. He has a rich career spanning decades, including working in the construction industry, Hollywood, and of course, writing some of America's best historical novels. He's been called the king of the historical novel. He's authored 12 novels, Back Bay, Nerve Endings, The Rising of the Moon, Cape Cod, Annapolis, Citizen Washington, Harvard Yard, The Lost Constitution, City of Dreams, The Lincoln Letter, Bound for Gold, and of course his latest book, December 41. It's a thriller. We're here today with William Martin, historical fiction author, and we're going to discuss one of his books, Citizen Washington about the life of George Washington. Bill, how about giving us an overview of the arc of George Washington's life? Well, they called him first in war, first in peace, uh, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. That was what Parson Weems said about him. And then when I wrote George Washington, The Man Who Wouldn't Be King, which was an episode of the American Experience on PBS some years ago. Uh, I called him first in war, first in peace, the first American to be set in stone. Uh, and that is the case with George Washington. However, the arc of his life is far more interesting than that. He isn't, uh, as John Adams once described him, born uh, wearing a powdered wig and a uh, saber, makes a stately bow to his mother and goes off and joins Ben Franklin to win the revolution. And that's a, a paraphrase of something that John Adams actually said. George Washington was born as the, uh, the third son of a middling tobacco planter on the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Tidewater area of Virginia. Uh, he was not the son who was going to inherit anything, if there was anything to inherit. Uh, and so he began as a young man on the make. Uh, as I said in the PBS special, a grasping, land-hungry young surveyor who would somehow make himself into a general who could win a revolution and then do what no general has had ever done before or has done since, which is that when he got his hands on power, he gave that power up, surrendered it to civilian authorities in order to create, as the Constitution says, a more perfect union. What is the process that leads a man to rise out of relatively humble beginnings to achieve that kind of stature, a stature that is born of acting honorably, acting in a way that we don't often see in politicians these days. And it gets back to, I think, an 18th century concept of reputation. Uh, George Washington like most of the people of the 18th century, believed in the importance of reputation. And just to get started, I want to read to you a little passage out of Citizen Washington, uh, which is a novel that is told through, the, uh, through 12 different narrators, some of them fictional, some of them historical, who tell their own life stories while they're telling the story of their, in, their encounters and their lifelong relationships with with George Washington. Now, this is a character who knew Washington for a long time and didn't particularly like him, but we'll come to, re 
to, to respect him by the time the story is over. It was a small world we moved in, don't forget. And what people thought about you mattered. You might think I don't give two dams for what men think about me, but your reputation means everything. It means more than saying you're good in a fight or rich or smart. It means you have the respect of the men around you. It means you know who you are and so does everybody else. It means your credit's good. Hell, it means you can say the cows will come home at dawn instead of at sunset and nobody's gonna get up early to prove you wrong. Uh, that's kind of the distillation, uh, a colloquial distillation of what reputation meant to all, all of these people. George Washington throughout the course of the revolution, uh, and we're probably getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. We're not talking about his, the middle of his life here, but throughout the course of the, the revolution and throughout his presidency, would always understand that he was by then acting for history and for the establishment of precedents that would that would form if not actual rules then then guidelines for how for future presidents could and should act uh, and so it's just very interesting to me and always has been as a writer to trace that that arc almost from those, those humble beginnings. He wasn't born in a log cabin the way that Lincoln was, but close to it. And um, he became, as, uh, as the King of England would say, King George III, after Washington surrendered the army and went home, uh, King George III heard about this and says, if Washington can do this, He'll be the greatest man in the world. So, kind of his um, his character uh, was developed by his reputation, or his reputation and character were intertwined right. Uh, right. throughout his well, life. Well, they were. They most of the boys who were being educated, and it was mostly young males who were educated. Young women were basically taught taught to read and to knit. Uh, it's their world, not ours. Uh, most of the males who went, who went to school, and Washington did for a time, uh, would be given a book called The Rules of Civility in Decent and Decent Conversation in, uh, no, The Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior in Company and Conversation. This was a hundred, a book of a hundred rules that had been first written by a, a group of French Jesuits and it had been translated and everybody had picked up on it as, as a good way to teach a young man how to begin to build and mold his reputation. This reputation would come from the fact that, that whether he acted honorably or not, it would come from the way that he conducted himself in business and in his job and in all those other things. And um, so from the very beginning, Washington was steeped in this this idea of reputation. The rules, some of them pretty interesting. Rule number one, of course, is uh, that some small gesture of respect should be made when you enter a room and meet people. That's very good. Rule number two is much more specific and has much more to do with manners. Uh, clean not thy teeth with the tablecloth or fork when seated at the table. If it must be done, use a pick tooth or a toothpick. Um, so uh, it's, that's how the rules bounce back and forth like that. I like rule number six, of course, and I always use it when I'm talking about Washington in front of an audience, uh, sleep not when others speak. Uh, but the most important of those rules is rule number 100, the last rule in the book. Uh, labor to keep alive in thy breast some small spark of that celestial fire called conscience. And I believe that Washington took that rule to heart. We know that he took the whole book to heart. There is actually at Mount Vernon um, 
a, a, a notebook that shows each of these rules written out in George Washington's uh, boyish hand sometime in the uh, 1730s or 1740s. Uh, and so we know that he carried that vision of what conscience was all about with him throughout his whole life. Didn't always inform his actions, but uh, uh, generally it did. You know, his father died, his brother married well and moved up to that place that he, he named after uh, a general that he had served with. This is the, the brother uh, um, Lawrence Washington and the general was General Vernon. And so he got this promontory of land on the Potomac and called it Mount Vernon. His, his brother George would later inherit Mount Vernon. Um, but young George recognized that uh, the way to begin to establish your reputation as a man of business and property was to get your hands on some property. And so he began studying surveying because uh, the best surveyors got the first look at the best lands. And he began buying up small pieces of property here and there. And by the end of his life, he would be, as uh, the old saying goes, land rich and cash poor. But he sure would own a lot of land. Uh, and that was, that was how he got started in the world of business, was as a young surveyor. Uh, we forget, however, that the next step in becoming a, um, uh, a man of property and reputation was to get a commission, serve in the military. And so he wanted to serve as a British officer and angled for that position for a long time. Uh, after his father died, when he was still young, one of his mother's brothers, um, or no, one of his patrons in Virginia got him a commission in the British Navy. Uh, George Washington was ready to set off and become a midshipman in the British Navy. And uh, his uncle, the brother of his mother, said, don't let him do this. Uh, he is the orphaned son or he, the fatherless son of an American or, or of a colonial who was, had no estate, has no connections, has no power in the British power structure. If you put him aboard a ship like that with the hopes that he will rise to become a captain or, a, or something higher than that, it will never happen. They will as this is a direct quote, they will fold him and staple him like a Negro or a dog. That's what the uncle wrote to the mother. And the mother at that point said, George, you're not going. You're not going to be in the British Navy. Uh, and this is very early in his life, when he's about 14 years old. Uh, and that was what led him to decide, OK, if I can't do this, I'll become a surveyor. Uh, he, he learned the business of surveying, got out on the frontier, learned how to live, uh, live in the, the roughest and toughest of environments uh, because surveyors were out there sleeping on the ground for six months out of the year. And um, quite often in the winter when the uh, leaves were off the trees, so it was easier to make your sight lines and things like that. And um, uh, out of that, he he got well toughened up too. And so back in Virginia, back down on the tidewater, uh, he did what every good young man should do at the time and become, became part of the, uh, the militia, the Virginia militia regiment. And when the Indian, the French and Indian war came along, that was his first opportunity to rise, uh, in the militia as a, um, colonial serving at the side of the British troops. And then a long story unfolds out of all of that, starting with the fact that George Washington himself probably started the French and Indian War um, when he is 
sent north on one of his expeditions north northwest uh, to Pittsburgh, at that time called Fort Duquesne, uh, to deliver an ultimatum to the French to get out of the the, the Ohio countries uh, because the British held claim to them. And uh, the French, so he was informed, were on their way to meet him and perhaps to attack him. And so he led a detachment of uh, Virginia colonials and um, Iroquois, I think it was Iroquois, I can't remember the tribe, uh, uh, led them to ambush the French. And it happens. They open fire on a gang of French down in a little, can a little canyon or a little valley. Uh, they capture them. The uh, Indian chief Tanakarison kills one of them, who happens to be a French envoy to the British. And, um, and out of that will grow the French and Indian War, which, of course, will lead to the French um, the British defeating the French and the British to pay for the taxes on the French uh, or to pay for the war will raise taxes on the Americans. The Americans will, will rebel against the British um, and the British will, wait a second here, the, the British will raise taxes on the colonials, the French will aid the colonials in rebelling against the British. And in order to pay for that rebellion, they will raise taxes on the French, which will lead to the French Revolution, which will end ultimately in Napoleon. All of that begins with George Washington's action there in the, uh, uh, in the remote corner of Pennsylvania, as the British historian Horace Walpole would later write, the actions of a young Virginian uh, in the wilds of North America, set the world on fire. And that's when the world first comes to know, become aware of George Washington. I think it's in the year 1752 or so. So he's only 20 years old. He's a young man. So in the ambition, his ambitions had far reaching things happen. I mean, he, yeah. uh, he, made, uh, you know, he, he made his mark even maybe not even expecting to a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that keeps with the theme of, what, of that little bit of reading that I just gave you there, that character who is talking about Washington saying, it's a small world we moved in. He, he means along the tidewater, but the fact is that the population was, of the whole world was much, much smaller at the time. And if you happen to be in the right place at the right time, uh, you could make a much, in a way, a much larger impact on the, the whole human race than perhaps somebody in that situation would be today. And, uh, and Washington was one who was in those positions uh, for a long span of time. And we were very fortunate that he almost always made the right decisions, informed by uh, the people around him, and his concern with their respect or lack of respect for him and for his reputation, and informed as well by that celestial fire called conscience. What's, what is right and what is wrong? Now, I, I remember years ago when you did an event at the Royal House in Medford, yeah. mm -hmm. you made the statement that we could have dispensed with any of the founding fathers and the country would fundamentally be the same. But yep. if we dispensed with George Washington, the country would be fundamentally different. How, how, why would explain that? Because I was, I've was i been fascinated with that statement since you made it many years ago. Um, it, it isn't so much that we the country would be different, though I, it might be, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but I, I see it as, as an arch an archway uh, that runs from about 1770, 1774 to say Washington's death in um, 1799. Uh, 
uh, that the, the arch of American democracy. And you can take out Hamilton or you can take out Adams or Jefferson. They're all bricks in this, in this arch. But if you take Washington out, he's the keystone. He's the one who holds it all together. Uh, not only because he brings South and North together as a Virginia planter joining with the North, uh, but also because he brings a certain awareness of politics and is a military leader as well. And don't forget uh, the world up until that point had always turned to military leaders in order to give them governance in times of revolution uh, from the time of Julius Caesar and would again with, with Napoleon shortly, uh, shortly after Washington's death. Um, if you pull Washington out, all the efforts of everybody else collapse because Washington many times during the American Revolution is the only guy who's holding it all together. Uh, Adams is off in England trying his best and Jefferson's doing what he's doing and so forth. But only one guy is holding the army, the symbol of American resistance together. You know, Congress is popping to, from one city to the next in order to avoid the British and to avoid the, uh, um, uh, the, the law, basically, the British law. And so um, Washington is still there enduring and that's one of the key elements of uh his his powerful impact upon the the revolution it's his willingness not not to quit to stay right there as the keystone but um you know i do believe that america would look enormously different if it hadn't been for washington because say there had been some other uh general and there were there were a couple of guys, mostly British, Charles Lee and Horatio Gates, who thought they were as good as Washington, who thought they knew as much as Washington, uh, and who, who conducted themselves as if Washington uh, was an amateur in their presence. And in some ways he was. Not, he wasn't always the best military tactician, that's for sure. And uh, Charles Lee himself, uh, who had fought on the British side and had now come over to the American side. Uh, Charles Lee once said, oh, what I would not give to be made a dictator for a few months. Uh, and then he could do what all of the other generals who had become dictators could do uh, by overriding civilian authority. And the thing is that Washington resisted the blandishments to become a dictator. He resisted right up until the end of the revolution. In 1783, he resisted uh, calls from his own officer's corps to make himself king. He was furious about that idea. Why have we just fought in order to create another kingship, another royal family? We can't have that. George Washington understood and feared as much as the people around him in Congress, people like Franklin and Jefferson and all of them, uh, they feared the man on the horse, the man who would come along and turn the heads of so many Americans uh, by saying something like, I alone can fix it. I alone am the man who can lead you. George Washington, even though <laughs> history shows that he really was that man, never allowed himself to be seduced by that, that idea. Uh, and committing to the importance of democracy and to the, to the importance of a constitution and to the importance of a political structure uh, that was as carefully balanced as the United States Constitution, which is what Washington did at, in the second half of his career in the political half when he became the president of the Constitutional Convention, uh, and then, of course, the president of the United States, what Washington did there, culminating with the fact that after two terms, he happily handed over power and stepped away. Uh, those are the, the gifts that Washington gives us that, that save us 
from looking like what we might have ended up looking like. Just another, uh, just another bunch of colonists led by some tin pot dictator. Didn't happen. Thank God. Yeah. Thank you, George. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's revisit civility in this age. Is mm -hmm. uh, civility and decency important in today's digital world? Does it have a part, or is it recognized, or what do you think? Uh, I think that they should be. They aren't always, you know. Uh, neither is honesty, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, and and it's essential, I think, in the life of a republic, that there be some truths that we hold self-evident, and that these truths. Uh, whether we're talking about the grand theories of the Enlightenment from the Declaration of Independence or whether we're talking about whether it's raining outside or not, uh, these truths can't, can't be overturned with lies. And when they're proven to be true, you can't just double down and say, well, no, the sun is shining when it's, when it's pouring rain. And we see that too much in our political discourse today. We elected a man president whose major skill was inventing nasty nicknames for people. And these are things that lead a lot of us to be very concerned about where we're headed in this country. Uh, we've just seen two years ago a violent coup attempt on the United States Capitol itself and did this come out of a love and admiration for decency and honesty? Or did it come from some other source? You know, I've written the novel that we've talked about, uh, about the, the tenor of the United States in the 1930s. There was a great fascist uh, send. There were plenty of people who thought like the Europeans did in many cases, the Italians and Germans, that that a fascist government would be a good idea in this country. They thought that in, in the United States in the 18th century. And, you know, we see these periods of crisis uh, in our country today. And 50 years ago and back in the Civil War, we see these moments. And we just have to rely on um, uh, decency and uh, and, and honesty and all of the other virtues that Washington himself was a living embodiment of, uh, at least in the eyes of those who, around him. Because don't forget, he could also be cranky and had a, had a, very, uh, uh, a very sharp temper and things like that. Um, we, need, we need to believe in those things and conduct ourselves as if a society is watching us in the same way that Washington, with his awareness of reputation, conducted himself with a sense that a society was watching him. And so he'd better not disappoint them. Now, did you, when you were thinking about writing Citizen Washington, did you, did you ruminate, uh, like, could they, did you think, well, what about Citizen Adams? What about Citizen Jefferson? What about Citizen Franklin? Or was it always Citizen Washington in your mind? Well, because of the idea of Washington as the keystone, I think that uh, he was always the, the one that you'd want to write about uh, if you were sitting down to write about one of those, those guys and you wanted to tell the full story of the birth of America from the point of view of um, the, the revolution and the Constitutional Convention and all of the rest of it, was actually uh, David McCullough, who said to me one night over dinner, since I'd gotten to know him when I was writing uh, that episode of The American Experience, and he was the host of that show, uh, he said to me, you know, Bill, there's a wonderful novel in, the, in George Washington and the Revolution. And uh, I thought, yeah, he might be right about that. Uh, of course, he went off and wrote 1776, about one year in that revolution, and that's a fantastic book. 
and I went in the other direction and decided, well, if I'm going to tell the life, if I'm going to tell the story of George Washington and try to get at his character, what makes him tick, and why he is such a paragon uh, for Americans today as he was then, I'm going to have to tell the whole story from beginning to end. And so I created in Citizen Washington, which, by the way, is uh, it's not in print, but you can you can read it uh, through Kindle. It's available as a Kindle or as an audio book. Um, I tried to give you multiple perspectives on George Washington, just as we have multiple perspectives on political leaders today. Um, and uh, that meant creating uh, characters who were slaves, who were Iroquois Indians, who were uh, Virginia planters, along with Adams and Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton and all of the other people who come later in his life, uh, who will all be young men when he's already achieved his uh, level of importance as the United States, as, as the general of the of the army, the commander in chief. Um, so it was always Washington. And then Lincoln. I wrote about Lincoln, uh, as you know, in the Lincoln letter some years later. And, uh, and Lincoln would say um, of Washington at some point, I can't remember exactly what prompted him to say it, but he said, uh, um, Without Washington, there is nothing. Washington is the the star that outshines us all. Um, there were one lots of wonderful quotes about Washington's celestial character uh, after the battles of Trenton and Princeton, in which Washington took a revolution that looked like it was about to come to an end. Uh, there, in the uh, in the dark days of December of 1776. Washington was in a very bad state, wrote to his brother, I see the impossibility of serving with reputation. I think the game is pretty near up. Uh, he started making plans to go and hide out in the, uh, in the West with a small remnant of his army because the British, it appeared, were about to, to defeat him and to wipe out what was left of the uh, Continental Army. And then in the an amazing bold stroke on Christmas night of 1776. He leads his troops back across the Delaware. They strike at the Hessians, who have called them the country clowns, who have no respect for them whatsoever. He captures all of the Hessians in Trenton, captures all of their stores and supplies and so forth. Uh, and then a week later, the British send uh, uh, a whole regiment after him. And um, they're coming down one road, and he's leading his whole army around through a swamp back up to Princeton, uh, where he attacks the British detachment in Princeton and wins a, another small victory in, in Princeton. And the American press, such as it was, uh, goes crazy. Uh, Philadelphia newspaper wrote, if there are spots on Washington's character, they are like spots on the sun only discernible by the magnifying powers of the telescope. Uh, and that was how Washington, by his, his willingness ever to give up, and a, no, a sane man would have surrendered uh, to the fates that were about to engulf him, I think, um, in that first or second week of December. But Washington doesn't give up. He keeps trying to find a way out. He keeps trying to, to endure comes up with that, uh, that Trenton plan. The password, the watchword and response for the night are victory. You would say victory. And I'd have to say, if I was challenged by the words victory, I would have to say, or death. And that was, uh, uh, that was the way that Washington led the troops uh, on uh, December, it was actually December 24th. He gathered them that night on Christmas Eve to hear at the riverbank uh, being read to them words that he was mo moved, deeply moved by, the words of Thomas Paine writing in the American crisis. And Paine, Paine was marching with the troops at the time, and he was writing on a drumhead at night. 
these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot. Oh, I can't remember the rest of it. Sorry, I was going to impress you with, with, with another <laughs> lyric. And it is a lyric. Um, but he that stands it now shall have the love of men and women for generations hence. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. Washington had that read to his troops. And then they went and attacked Trenton the next day. Um, so I think that the, uh, the, the importance of Washington's presence at every step along the way of his life, the significance of it, whether he's starting the French and Indian War, whether he's right in the middle of the, the Braddock Massacre, which is the major battle of the French and Indian War, in, in, at least in, in the United States, um, or the colonies, uh, whether it's the revolution, the constitutional convention, or in the first presidency, it's always the most significant role being played by anyone. You know, there's a wonderful quote from Franklin in the, um, or many wonderful quotes from Franklin in the constitutional convention. Uh, they're debating this tripartite governing structure with, uh, you know, judicial, legislative, and executive branch. Well, who's going to lead the executive branch? Who's going to be the president? Uh, and don't we all fear that whoever is the president will have dictatorial instincts? Uh, this is a debate that was very serious in the uh, Constitutional Convention. And Franklin looks at the chair where Washington is sitting. And Washington didn't say very much in the Constitutional Convention. He looks in the, at the chair where Washington is sitting and he says, uh, I know not what sort of man may follow, but I can be sure that the first man who occupies the presidential chair will be a good one. And you know, Washington was basically made president by acclamation mostly because of the example of, of, that he had given in the, in the revolution, the, uh, the resistance that he had shown to the blandishments of power uh, by achieving, la by giving up power, he achieved lasting historical fame and admiration. They would have excoriated him in the revolution or during his presidency if he had decided to make himself a dictator. Uh, he believed in civil authority and he believed in the Constitution that they hammered out in Philadelphia in that summer of 1787. Uh, and Bill, um, do you know the story of Sarah Bradley Fulton of Medford? They're re resurrecting her spirit. And uh, she supposedly made the costumes for the Boston Tea Party. Oh. And um, she. <clears throat> No. went on a, a spy mission uh, in, into Boston through the troops in the middle of the night, a very stirring story, and delivered an important message to Charlestown. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the war, after the war, George Washington visited Medford to thank her for her action uh, during that time. And mm -hmm. uh, on October 1st in Medford, for the second year, they had a special celebration day for Sarah Bradley Fulton. But so even our little town of Medford got a visit by George Washington. Yes, yeah. Well, he visited a lot of places and um, had a lot of impact in all of the places he visited. And, what, and some, what... some of the places he didn't visit. Uh, on his 1789 journey to, Amer to, to New England, uh, he did it he, in his first year of his presidency. He did a tour into New England to, to basically show the presidential flag. Um, had a nice banquet in Faneuil Hall, which is the opening. It's the first scene of, in my first novel, the banquet in Faneuil Hall. And there were three ways, three main routes into Massachusetts from the South uh, at this time. 1789. You either came up the lower post road, which is now Route 1, uh, running all the way from New York 
up through Connecticut and Rhode Island and into Massachusetts. Or you came the Upper Post Road, which was the fastest, which came up to about Route 20 or the Mass Pike and then straight west into, into Boston. Or you came on the Middle Post Road, which is basically Route 16. Uh, and it comes up through Connecticut and then sneaks into Massachusetts. And Washington uh, went up, came into the city, came into Boston on the upper post road, and he left on the middle post road. He would not go on the lower post road. And the reason for that was that the only state that had not ratified the Constitution by the time that George Washington was president, the state which in some ways had it had been an instigator for the Constitutional Convention because of their, their financial practices. The state of Rhode Island, um, which was printing, printing paper money that was nearly worthless in order to pay its debts, and that was part of the motivation for needing a new constitutional government so that the federal government could, could control currency. Um, Washington was basically saying, until you ratify the Constitution, I won't show my face in your state. And so, uh, you know, he, he came, he, even in his little journeys to places like Medford or Boston or Rhode Island or anywhere else, he was making a statement about the importance of, of unity and of, about the significance of uh, the constitution that we had now uh, all decided to adhere ourselves to. Well, we could easily do another session for this, Bill. Thank you very much for um, coming here to tell us about George Washington's life. We appreciate it and um, learn some new things. It's been Good. great. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, John.